Hello everyone, I'm Christy Edwards. I'm a project officer on the FLEX grant, which is in the Federal Office of Federal Health Policy. Uh, thank you for taking the time to participate in our review of the EMS portion of the FLEX program. Uh, joining our discussion today is Sarah Young, who is the FLEX program coordinator. Sarah, would you like to... Hi everyone, and thank you so much for setting this up, Christy. It's really great to have you all on this webinar. Um, I think everyone who's interested in tuning into this realizes that Christy has spent most of the year collecting input from a wide range of stakeholders on the role and opportunities and confusions for rural emergency medicine within the FLEX program. And I want to emphasize that we have and do and continue to really want your input as FLEX grantees and FLEX stakeholders on this topic so that the FLEX funds are really most effectively serving the rural communities in your states. So um, I'm really interested in hearing both what Christy has to say and the kinds of questions that you guys can bring up to inform the discussion. Great. Thank you, Sarah. So just a quick overview of our agenda today. Uh, we're going to just take a quick glance at the FLEX legislation and the program guidance that is relevant to EMS. Um, then I'll go a little bit into some of the comments that I received over the last year from various stakeholders, uh, including most of the people who were on this webinar. Uh, I'd like this to be pretty interactive, so I'll be asking some questions throughout the presentation. So first of all, the legislative authority, the FLEX program, uh, this is the second half of it, which uh, pertains to uh, rural EMS. The first portion is focused on critical access hospitals. And these are two of the three EMS activities uh, that were, allowed, were uh, put into the guidance uh, for, for uh, the 2015 to 2017 year. So uh, FLEX has five programs, three of which are dedicated to critical access hospitals, one which has EMS activities, um, and the other one is for uh, innovative models projects. <clears throat> While EMS has been a component of FLEX since its inception, um, for this grant cycle we wanted to refocus on evidence-based interventions um, and sort of improve the way that we were measuring success in the FLEX program. Um, so the three EMS activities are I, can you guys still hear me? My no my network is working. So. Yep. yep. Okay. Can hear you. My um, internet my my internet just went down all of a sudden. Um, so I may need some I may need some help advancing the slides if you could. All right, I'm on activity 3.06. Yes, okay. Yeah, so the three activities were EMS assessments, uh, time critical diagnosis, uh, capacity building, and then uh, EMS capacity and operations. So if you go to slide six, EMS in the current program cycle. Yep. So. Uh, here we have just sort of a breakdown of how uh, funds were spent in the first year. So this is the year that ended uh, August 31st of 2016. Um, and this was, this was data that was collected through our internal uh, data collection system that FLEX coordinators put in. Um, we're trying to do a better job of getting the data out to you, uh, so I wanted to kind of highlight, first of all, a couple of ways that we might use the data, and then also tell you a little bit about uh, the FLEX program, or the EMS portion of the FLEX program. So as you can see, um, EMS activities accounted for just under $1 million, or approximately 4% of reported activity-specific FLEX funds. Uh, this was the first year that we were collecting this information in this way, um, and it does appear that uh, the totals were somewhat underreported. Um, 
So I think that so we're still sort of adjusting the way that we do this and the messaging. Um, so hopefully we'll work out some kinks and the, it'll be a little a little better next year. Um, but um, just under a million dollars or four percent of total funds does seem uh, a little low. And uh, I was just I was just wondering based on my conversations with everybody. Um, EMS is a high priority for a lot of people, um, and I was just I just wanted to hear a little bit of feedback about from Flex program staff. Um, did you spend less than you had wanted to spend? Um, and if so, uh, what would you have liked to have spent it on, and why were you not able to do so? And you might have to push star two to unmute your line or enter a question in the chat box. Hi, Christy. This is Stephanie from Idaho. Um, one of the biggest deterrents for me was the, the type of measures that you guys are requiring for EMS agencies. So there are a lot of activities that EMS can be engaged in, like uh, roundtable discussions with EMS medical directors. Um, there are uh, a number of things, but they're not collecting the type of data that you guys are requiring for Flex. So that was one of the biggest challenges for me, was to try and figure out what was it that Flex needed and what activities was Flex um, going to be able to support, and then trying to figure out what their needs were and, and divvying it up between the two. Right now, time-sensitive emergencies or time-critical diagnosis is kind of where we put our emphasis. Um, because that seems to fit into the niche of flex. But I know that the, the metrics that you guys are requiring was a big deterrent for us. Thank you, Stephanie. And any other comments? And remember, you can always type into the chat box, too, and we can read out your question if it's too hard to make the phone work. Sure. All right. Uh, Bob Russell is asking, we had, or commenting, we had difficulty getting our EMS to commit to spending our agreed allocation and accomplish the tasks given. I guess that's not really a question, Bob, but thank you for your comment. Yeah, that's very helpful. System Wilson, and I think I had uh, some uh, difficulties with some of the types of assessments that I wanted to do. Um, we were looking more at uh, some larger scope assessments uh, that didn't fall, didn't quite fall into kind of the work plan. That I, I don't necessarily know if it was something that was more at the federal level, but uh, coming at the local work plan level where I came in. Uh, midstream uh, into my, my position. Um, so we're, you know, I think part of that is for, at least in my perspective, is we're re reworking um, that and also kind of broadening the scope um, to um, allow us to do more with EMS. Um, some of that uh, you know, time critical diagnosis, um, and then some of the training that goes around that, um, and then also if we're looking at capacity and operational projects, um, I still think that uh, in including some of that leadership development would go into there as well. Great, thank you for that feedback. I really appreciate it. And, and John Ike says, since EMS was put into the third bucket of funding. It competes for funding from population health initiatives and innovation projects, uh, and that bucket is limited to 30% of your proposal. I think we're still waiting on a couple of other comments. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Thank you, Tim. Sorry. This is here from Kansas, and one of the other challenges I had was, or challenges I've experienced this far, I was 
the new area in the, the in FOA talks about community level rural EMS system assessment. And it really was a bit unclear exactly what uh, the federal office was wanting to achieve or what the expectations were of that. And so that made it really hard to figure out what strategies or activities to do. And, and what's happened is actually it's evolved over the last 15 months to us not really, um, when you look at the graph and we get ready to put our own report in, we won't be dedicating as much money into it because we've identified ways to do um, look at the statewide system that meets the expectations of the federal office but doesn't require that much money. So it, I, I think some clarity on some of the areas was hard for us to determine really what was the federal office wanting us to do when it came to the community level rural EMS system assessment um, or improving capacity and operation projects. Great, thank you. Uh, it looks like we have a couple of other comments as well. Uh, Gina says, I would like to echo the comments of Stephanie that EMS is not collecting the type of time critical diagnosis data. Um, in a in Montana, due to uh, volu the volunteer based structure of a large quantity of EMS systems in the state. And Nita says uh, that she would like to see population health broken out as a separate uh, program area. John says, also many of our initiatives span uh, quality improvement and EMS stroke initiatives, for example, span from pre-hospital to inpatient as long as we can break up the projects so that the EMS portions are paid in the third bucket, that helps. Okay. So it looks like we're getting quite a few comments on uh, uh, over here in the chat box. I'm just going to advance to the next slide and uh, wait for you guys to finish doing your comments. Um, so we can just sort of keep things moving here. All right. So uh, this slide is really just sort of uh, a summary of how uh, improvements were counted in uh, the PIMS data. Uh, we've heard from a lot of people uh, that the way that the way that this was structured, um, there was a lot. There was a lot of things that needed to be clarified, and we needed a much better uh, definitions and guidelines for actually how to fill out the section. Um, so uh, this doesn't, you know, this is probably not entirely reflective. Um, but I, I did want to ask about this. Um, you know, we really need you to help us understand um, what kinds of improvements your EMS agencies are making as a result of your activities so that we can make sure that we're capturing the right thing. Okay. Um, and I would also say from the program perspective, as we try to make PIMS more, a more focused tool to reflect some, although certainly not all, of the impacts that you are having with the FLEX grants, are we asking the right questions in PIMS, both in the EMS section um, and in other sections as well? That's, you can bug me about the other sections. You don't need to bug Christy about those. But please keep those thoughts in mind. couple more comments in the comment box. Tom Nearing typed that rural EMS system assessment is limited because system assessment includes more than just a community level assessment. Um, so a regional or statewide assessment would be of greater help, but might take more funds than are available. And Kevin 
commented that the spending amount may go up in years two and three. Assessments then in year one are relatively low cost, but the projects that result from them may require a higher budget. Yeah, that's a good point as well. All right. Uh, and John says, uh, if there were a statewide assessment of EMS capacity that could be used to measure project after intervention, um, and I, I know that uh, I know John that many of people have been using uh, the attributes of a successful EMS service. I know that that's been a very popular uh, tool, um, and it, it's being used pretty pretty widely. Um, is, is there a link to more information on that, that tool that you could share in the chat box, John? Thank you. All right. Uh, so I, I see that you're still typing something, Tim, but I'm just going to start uh, to keep things moving a little bit. Uh, so current activities. Um, this is just sort of a list of the most frequently, the most frequent activities. Um, so quality improvement, obviously the assessments were a major activity because they were required if you were going to do an EMS activity, um, but then there were also some quality improvement projects, um, trauma facility designation and trauma trauma team development, uh, so cross-training between uh, EMS and hospital staff, establishing protocols, um, and building the kinds of professional relationships that really uh, improve patient care. Um, that was, those were also very popular. Uh, there are also about four uh, pilot or test projects going on related to community paramedicine and mobile integrated health. Um, and they mostly focus sort of on the high utilizers of EMS services, so the people who go to the hospital, who are uh, being driven to the hospital in an ambulance uh, multiple times in a year, uh, figuring out how to better um, manage those people's care so that they uh, don't have to go to the emergency room so much. And then also diverting uh, people who call 911 but then don't actually really need to go to the hospital, um, diverting them to other alternative health care options. And then uh, the, so the leadership training, I'm going to talk about this a little more later, um, but I, I, I heard from I heard from about two-thirds of the flex coordinators that the leadership training was a huge, that, that the leadership training was hugely important. Um, and there were only a couple of projects this year because of some of the language and the guidance. Um, but we'll get to that. We'll get, we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, so community engagement, some people talked about uh, involving community leaders in uh, better in helping them to assess the needs of the community and what EMS can do uh, within the community, uh, education, and then also sort of looking at expanding the role of EMS. Uh, so data collection goes, goes along with the quality improvement. I know that uh, data collection systems are uh, required in some form uh, in a lot of states, um, and capacity building from that was uh, also a frequently chosen activity. Uh, a couple of people uh, also said that they had worked with on learning online learning management systems uh, for continuing education for their uh, for their rural EMTs and paramedics. And then there were some sort of network development activities and management training. 
stakeholder perspectives. Uh, so, uh, over the last year, I did listening sessions with every FLEX program that's active in EMS. I talked to 31 FLEX coordinators. Uh, and then I also did a listening session at the Rural EMS Leadership Conference last year um, with no store. Uh, I've also been talking to various other subject matter experts, uh, Gary Wingrove for, um, for community paramedicine, um, and then you know, some other people who are sort of prominent in particular areas of, uh, of expertise. Um, so sort of the common things that I saw were the need for the workforce issues, um, shortage of trained personnel, uh, and, and disappearing funding for paid personnel. Um, and then community engagement and education. Uh, and then one of the biggest things that I that I heard from people was, which is kind of related to the workforce issue, is that there was a lot of discussion about the volunteer model of EMS um, not really being feasible or a sustainable way to uh, provide EMS services in a lot of rural communities. Um, and there was a huge need uh, to find a different way of delivering the same care. Um, and for many people, that meant sort of expanding uh, how EMS works in the community and finding other ways to uh, to add value to their communities. Um, and then the other thing that I will mention is that uh, coordination among local agencies, hospitals, uh, and air medical um, was also frequently discussed. Um, and then again, I'm going to show you it's leadership training. I promise we're getting to that in just a minute. Okay, so specifically from the C programs, I heard uh, sort of a few things that worked, a few things that could use some some work. Um, so the focus on time critical diagnoses uh, seemed to be uh, successful. I heard very little negative about it, um, and it was also the most popular the most popular uh, activity area. Um, so uh, then several people also mentioned that integration with the healthcare system is a significant issue. Um, you know, moving from the public service and sort of social club atmosphere into more of a healthcare focused um, model. I also heard a lot about the 25% cap on flex funds, uh, which was cited as an unnecessary limitation on how states use their funds. Uh, and there were there were some positive comments about the assessments, um, and I I also did hear some uh, desire for better guidelines on how to conduct those assessments. Um, and to make them, to sort of allow people to do the assessments in a way that uh, made the most sense for their states and their communities. OK, so leadership training, we're here. So this is the controversial reference to leadership training in uh, the FLEX uh, funding opportunity announcement from 2015. Uh, that funding opportunity announcement is the guidance, the Bible on how you do FLEX program, how you uh, were supposed to structure your FLEX program uh, for 2015, 2016, and 2017. Um, that is available in the file share on the left side of the screen. 
so that you can look at it. Um, but I, so I, what I wanted to talk about about this was just that this is one of the issues that was mentioned the most, even by those who had never been involved in leadership training activities. Um, and though it was never intended to completely prohibit activities, but to sort of move states towards more rigorous evaluation and evidence-based activities, the effect was to essentially stop funding leadership activities. The leadership training is perceived as one of the only available ways to address an urgent need and not allowing it was perceived as a subjective decision that unnecessarily restricted state activities and ultimately caused a rift um, between flex grantees and F4HP. And I will tell you that we are addressing this. Um, this, this will be addressed uh, in the next in the next round. Okay. So, sort of some of my takeaways from the the comments that you gave me, um, and sort of my own research into what's going on, um, were just the need for clearer guidance around uh, what the measures are, the guidelines for how you do an activity, and then just, and just sort of some clarity around what is allowable and what isn't, um, and then and expectations for uh, state performance, which uh, is sort of tied to measures, and then also giving clear guidelines about how the assessment should be done. So one of the major themes across much of the feedback that I received is that there is a clear need for new funding and patient care models. Um, and also by encouraging test projects uh, and providing a clear framework for developing and evaluating a project, uh, it, it's possible that we could give states uh, an opportunity to show the effectiveness and value of interventions um, and help build an evidence base for a variety of badly needed interventions. So uh, quality performance improvement, uh, it may be an imperative given the movement towards data-driven healthcare. Um, and flex could be a great help uh, to struggling rural agencies to prepare for uh, this change. Uh, and the last one down here is that Flex doesn't have the capacity or resources to solve all of the problems. There are thousands of rural agencies, um, and they have a variety of problems, and some of them very significant. Uh, and the way that the best way that we can uh, try to address as much of that as possible and maximize the funding that we have um, is to forge partnerships with other organizations. Uh, and the EMS Advisory Council, uh, which is meeting on a temporary basis over the next few weeks to help us determine the direction of this program. Um, but we're also then going to establish a permanent advisory group uh, about EMS issues in the FOX program. Uh, and we will be putting out some information about how that's going to happen uh, in the next in the next uh, couple of months. So I would like to emphasize that these are ideas. This was my take on sort of what we could do with EMS and the Flex program. I'm not telling you what we're going to do. Um, these are my ideas. And I'm inviting your input um, to help us create a path forward. So at this time, 
I would like to invite some questions and comments. I did want to go back. OK, so for current activities, um, are there activities that people did that they feel like don't really fit in any of these categories uh, that would be notable or important to mention? So all, well, while you guys are thinking about Christy's question, I will summarize some of what's been typed into the comment box in the last couple of minutes. Tom and Kevin asked about what do we mean by next round. And thank you, Mike, for clarifying in the chat box that next round is really the next multi-year flex cycle. That's the opportunity to make substantive changes in the guidance and um, program direction. The uh, NCC that's coming out next week, actually, is a chance to update your progress on your current three-year plan of work, which isn't to say that you can't make any changes, but it's much more limited. Um, a uh, person in the chat box, Christy, asked if you're saying that there's a need for EMS interventions or that there's a need for an evidence base for these interventions. There, there's an, well, both. So there are a need for new ways of doing things to address some of the problems that have been cropping up over the last few decades, um, particularly around sustainability of funding models um, and the volunteer issue. Um, but the the way that uh, how if it, the evidence base fits in is uh, that you know we try we sort of encourage some trial pro projects. So we encourage you to try some specific interventions, um, maybe just ideas that you've had or based on another pro project that was successful, um, and then you come back and you tell us how it went, um, and you tell us. Is this a good way to do? Is this a good thing to include uh, in the flex guidance in uh, in the flex program? Uh, and is this an intervention that uh, could be distributed more widely to other agencies, not just the ones that work with the flex program? Does that answer your question? Um. The same person, I believe, typed in the chat box, is the sustainability volunteer model actually an intervention, though? OK, yeah, OK. So perhaps I should be a little bit more specific with that. So uh, the volunteer model is something that isn't really working. So uh, there's a movement towards uh, finding ways to get towards a uh, paid model that better integrates uh, EMS into healthcare. So sort of redefining EMS uh, sort of in the community paramedicine uh, context, moving towards uh, having EMTs and paramedics go out to people's houses and help them manage chronic diseases, um, and to perform other kinds of services in the community for which uh, they could actually they could actually get paid eventually. That's the hope. And um, star two to unmute your line if you want to ask a question and clarify more than is possible to do in the chat box. Hey, Christy, this is Don. Hi, Don. Hey, you asked about a comment on the current activity stuff. And uh, I just wanted to throw in there your line on trauma facility designation and the trauma team development, <clears throat> that is part of a, a group of 
time sensitive or what they call time critical diagnoses and also includes the stroke issues, stroke receiving facility designation and also okay. the STEMI stuff. And I think if you're going to put the trauma, seat, trauma facility designation on there, you need to include all of those in that category. That is that is an excellent point. I really appreciate that. And I think that, that also sort of gets towards the protocols of where you take a patient um, and sort of how that plays into the designations for semi stroke uh, and trauma. So I, yep. I really appreciate you. I really Thank appreciate you. that. So uh, Stephanie asks, how would the Flex Grant have a role in changing a volunteer model? Um, so Flex could uh, help to fund some pilot projects. So you have an idea of how you would like to implement a program using EMS to help uh, to uh, help uh, diabetics better manage their conditions. Uh, and you come to us and you say we want to do this project, um, and then we help fund we help fund uh, the training and the capacity building and um, just sort of the some of the kind of general uh, provide assistance in sort of bringing together the stakeholders and um, sort of putting it together um, and then we would help sort of uh, disseminate the 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 data that you get from that um, that's sort of that's sort of what what I am thinking. There are some chat questions that have been addressed in chat. Um, anyone else on the phone line that wants to say something? Uh, Bob asks, what type of partnerships are you looking for? Um, so some of the several, there were flex programs who had said uh, that they were uh, that they were working with their state office of EMS uh, to do program to add a rural specific component to projects that the state office of EMS was already doing. Uh, so I sort of see that as a natural partnership uh, for a certain, for, for a lot of states, not necessarily all of them. Uh, but then, you know, we would also be sort of open to partnerships in other ways, um, other kinds of organizations, um, the state offices of the EMS was sort of the natural one for me. I think that's a fair question to ask um, people on this webinar to think about and provide feedback to. Where are your most valuable partnerships that help improve the um, availability and capacity of rural EMS services? to rural communities. What what are the key partnerships that we need to know about? Because you're the ones working with those people, which is wonderful. Yeah, and you know, piggybacking on that, there are some restrictions on what we can let you spend flex funds on that we don't have any control over. So um, if you wanted to do some kind of project uh, that uh, you needed funding for something that we couldn't necessarily provide. Um, we can't buy we can't buy ambulances, for example, um, and other kinds of sort of things like that. Uh, and we can't really pay for direct patient care, but we would we would pay for the part that included all of the training and. 
uh, sort of the uh, planning of the project. Um, that's where Flex could fit in. Um, and so maybe you would be working with another organization to uh, help get some uh, to help get some additional support from another organization to help cover some of the other costs. If uh, I have a question, if it's okay, this is Bob Rankin. Sure. Um, when, uh, you know, when we talk about the partnership, uh, we, we're the state agency. You know, I work for the Louisiana Bureau of Emergency Medical Services. We provide the state oversight in in education um, for EMS. And you talked about some of the rural training. And we definitely have a, a area of the state. I don't want to say is neglected, but for the lack of a better way of putting it, we have an area that is, is typically being neglected. It, it, it's kind of like in the middle part of our state. We just seem to have that hole, and that's. I, I think our interest is is when I looked at some of your programs, uh, such as community engagement, that could actually be a a dual role enforcement for us because we have a very, very bad uh, retention rate. Uh, at one time, uh, we had a retention rate of about 25% in, in our educational programs. Um, uh, it was actually even worse than that. It was out of every 100 students, only 23 were maintaining into the programs. Um, so that's where we're looking to uh, try to, I, I guess, in a workforce kind of a way, but through education. I saw that you had community engagement um, uh, to maybe develop programs that would almost market. I don't want to say market because we're not going to be advertising, but more of a way to, to market what the what EMS is because uh, when you look at the community paramedicine, the mobile integrated health care, uh, some areas are even using paramedics in emergency rooms to give the individual more of a career or open-mindedness of you don't just go to school, become a paramedic, and spend the next 20 years in the back of an ambulance. So is, is this something that we could engage with somebody uh, to maybe seek out some of that assistance to develop these type of educational programs? Yes. There are several states who are already involved in doing some of that with their EMS, with their state offices of EMS. Um, and you can get in contact with your state office of rural health uh, and ask them if they would be interested in partnering with you on that kind of project. Certainly, that, okay. that, that's definitely an option. All right. Thank you. What, what state were you, did you say we were in Nebraska, Bob? Louisiana, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally scrambled that one. Uh, no, we're in Louisiana. Yeah, and we just we do we have a it's and it's very distinct. Even in the in the rawest way that we pull down the data, we have a, a gap that when you get into the larger cities such as New Orleans and Baton Rouge, it's just not the problem. But the moment that you leave it out of there, and Louisiana is still very, very much rural. In, almost in the central part of the state, um, there's there's absolutely nothing. There's absolutely nothing. We even did a, a, a real scarce data research survey on where most of the medics we have in our state live, and they're pretty much in the rural areas. They're just not working there. So we're trying to find a way to, to mend that gap, close it up. Um, I definitely believe it's through uh, community engagement uh, and maybe 
to some of the other training modules because it's it's um, we have such and I give you another piece of statistics right before we went to the accredited paramedic classes to show you the numbers we in in November of 2012 we had 335 paramedics enrolled in school um, in November of 2015 we only had 92 so there, there's a distinct drop off, and uh, I, I think it's uh, notif notifying. You know, people don't. I don't think people really see. They see us, but they don't really see us. So that that's where we were kind of going with some of that. Hey, Christy, okay. on the uh, leadership issue, as far as um, being able to change things uh, mid. Uh, mid-competitive cycle, it seems that, as you said, any substantive changes would need to be um, done at the competitive mark. But the on the leadership piece, it was, as you said, not disallowed. It was discouraged, uh, or you you all encouraged us to look elsewhere if considering it. So it seems like that encouragement. Uh, could be modified without needing to make a substantive change. You could just let us know um, through an e email to all parties that that uh, leadership um, activities are now being uh, considered uh, acceptable, and so that could happen by the next cycle. Not, I mean, by the next proposal, not the next competitive cycle. John, I would encourage you to carefully read the NCC instructions on Tuesday. Will do. And attend the NCC webinar. <laughs> that is next week as well. I, I can't wait. It'll be great. <laughs> yes. Going to be wonderful. Um, so to your point about recruitment and retention issues, um, I think that that's another opportunity. You mentioned doing uh, kind of a study of where people, where your paramedics lived and where they worked um, and trying to figure out how you can recruit those people uh, to work in those rural communities. Um, I think that that would be another opportunity for some sort of uh, test project or a pilot of some kind um, to find a way to think about how to deal with that because that's a universal problem. Everybody is having issues with that. Um, so I think that, that that might be a good opportunity for a project like that. Do you happen to have an idea of what other states that we could maybe reach out to, to to see how they're maybe approaching the problem? Uh, the recruitment and retention issue? I yes, don't have that information. I don't have that information available to me at right this moment, um, but I will uh, send that out. I will, I will send you an answer out once uh, after, the, after the end of the webinar. You can also oh, browse. You. So I'd also encourage anyone who wants to know more about what the FLEX program in your state or other states are doing to browse to the link to the state FLEX profiles that I shared in the chat box. Hi, this is Davis, and I work with Bob in the Louisiana Department of Health. And Bob and I are actually in the same building, but I wanted to build on what he was saying. Uh, we've had conversations with rural health clinics and other rural providers about looking into the community paramedicine model, which I think is a great model. Um, one of the challenges is I would like to see, and I know that the flex funding is limited to rural areas, critical access hospitals, but I'd also, if possible, if, if there's any way that we could do some type of demonstration or pilot using a community paramedicine model with some funding from FLEX while we're looking at the rural aspect 
context of the community paramedicine, um, let's just say a pilot, then I'd also like to simultaneously look at that same kind of model in an urban setting so that we can learn from both instances. But I think with the flex funding, there might be some limitations in the way that we can do that. So I just wanted to see what you guys thought about if we did do something on that on that level, which we're absolutely kind of ecstatic about that you guys are talking about, then I'd like to see us explore pilot using both those ways. So I wanted to see if you guys could talk about what 